bien, c'est la vache. Pas qu'à dormir. Comme si ils vont balayer de l'eau à voyer, ils vont nous problème. Je vais la mer avec du papa, tu sais que je vais la mer pour ne pas battre à ce que je peux voir. They were afraid of the wind, so they, they each held a child. Hurricane Toma was predicted to hit Port-au-Prince within hours. Two million were left vulnerable in the camps, despite billions of dollars in aid. Seventy miles. It's not good. The closer it came, the more nervous people got. What is that line? Uh, for going to to get cash in the bank. Wow, it's two to three hours. Whatever, whatever services. The hurricane that's coming is supposed to last like twelve hours. They're saying. At 4 p.m., the rain began to fall. Most internally displaced persons, or IDPs, did not evacuate the camps. They told us all they had now was in flimsy tents on the land they stood on, except they didn't even have the land. The facade of land rights is something the NGOs grappled with long before the hurricane. Who actually owns the land? The fact is, the lack of coordination and accountability among NGOs are big reasons why Haiti's IDPs were still IDPs 10 months after the quake. But another reason, no one really knows who owns the land in Haiti. The land laws here in Haiti are so fucked up. It is just absolutely horrid. A uh, gentleman was trying to sell a piece of land to somebody that I know for a development. Eight people showed up claiming to own the same land, and they all had documents. I'm going to need something in writing from anybody that has claims to this property. The land registry hasn't been updated for decades, and many of the records that did exist were lost in the quake. So even the most effective aid organization runs into the problem of the landowners, or those who claim to be. How are they expelled? Is it the army? Is it the police? Who's, who's doing this? Propriété terreau, propriété terreau. On a étudié les grandons. On dit qu'un pile terreau est au grandon, mais gagné. And they'll kick off just about anyone. We had in April when the bulldozers were here going over everyone's houses. Mm -hmm. It was her house that the bulldozer was was about to hit it. Bon, les bulldozers étaient venus là pour lui écraser le canon. C'était dans le mois d'avril. Et puis, à blanc mac, il était pas en pile de gars qui en pile car la te bâtit net. Et puis actuellement, blanc mac était pensé, il était du moins. Si on vient écraser le canon, il était bon numéro de téléphone. We had to explain that there was a young child who lived there, an elderly blind woman, and two young girls that were inside the house that was about to be bulldozed. And that's how we finally got human rights officers from the United Nations to come out here. As Haiti's chief relocation advisor, Gerard Emile Brun was supposed to find a place for the IDPs to go. And he did. It might look familiar. The owner of this land stood to make millions for allowing the IDPs on it. The owner is a company called Nabatac. The president of Nabatac is Gerard Emile Brun. NGOs and donor nations say that this kind of corruption is one reason why they don't report to or work with the Haitian government. Less than 1% of the billions in aid has gone to or through Haiti's government. The Dole Amendment prevented the, the U.S. government from giving money to the government of Haiti. And if the money continues to bypass the government, how will Haitians ever be able to take care of themselves? People say, well, donors channel the money outside the government so there is no corruption. And it's the contrary. When, when you have all this money circulating outside government control, first of all, you know, government employees, they, they charge bribes for everything because they see all the money circulating. And of course, that's what's going to happen. So it's creating corruption. 
Many of the aid workers and others we met were in Haiti to make a difference and then leave. We want to work ourselves out of a job, and then what we'll do is reevaluate if there's any more gaps, we'll fill those gaps and do the same thing, try mm -hmm. and fill up, you know, work our way out of a job. <laughs> I want to be done with Haiti. I mean, um, in my particular job, what says to me is, is that, you know, if foreigners like like yourselves still want to come to Haiti and do stories on Haiti and it's still in the international limelight, it means that we have done something wrong. I look at Haiti as a tremendous opportunity. I believe that the best days for this country are in front of them. But in order to make real change in Haiti, there has to be real change in the way aid functions. You know, to ask NGOs to, you know, un to not do things the way they've been doing for 20 years is going to be difficult. But I think that you've got some that, that, that are willing to do it. So what is to be done? Graciana Del Castillo says, start with a matrix. You have to have a matrix to see who is going to do what and where. Because what's happening now is that one is doing a school here, the other one is doing a road there. And nobody knows what's going on. My matrix is not very ambitious. My matrix focuses on few things that can be done in the short run and that can have an impact on those groups that were most affected by the crisis. The idea here is not that you should stop giving money to aid organizations. Rather, experts say, give wisely and hold NGOs accountable if they aren't already doing so themselves. If you decide to move in to help people, if you decide to move in to intervene in humanitarian suffering, or to intervene in, um, in, um, in the course of history, you know, you decide to pour your, your billions into a country, then uh, make bloody sure that you know what you're doing. It's up to taxpayers also to put pressure on governments to ensure that they are supporting the NGOs that are really having a positive impact. Who is accountable to me? The U.S. government is accountable to me. Care who gets U.S. government money is not accountable to me, but to the U.S. government. So as a citizen, who, I'm, who I have the most effectiveness with is my government. And remember that the NGOs don't exist in a vacuum. They exist in a very specific policy in political and economic milieu where they, res they respond to external pressures. Call your senator, call your congressperson, make this, a, you know, write letters to the editor, have a, you know, a relatively you know, simple message and a, you know, and an actual constituency that can make changes like Congress. For once, Haiti got lucky. Hurricane Tomas skirted the island. There was still wind and rain, but it wasn't the storm that many feared. Oh man. With rain still falling, we went back to Camp Carado. The storm wasn't as bad as everybody thought it was going to be because the wind didn't pick up. We saw Edith as soon as we pulled in. Did your tent flood last night? Can she show us? So we're going to go see if uh, Vilna, the who we met two days ago, um, how she did during the storm. Ça va? <laughs> Bonjour. Yeah? Okay. Bonjour. Bonjour. They were afraid of the wind, so they, they killed the child. Uh, in Haiti, the aid world promised us and promised each, each, each other to do it different this time. Here, you need managers. You need people who are willing to do things and to take risks and to do things not in the best way because, you know, all the distortions that you have in emergencies, but you have to do it. So there was going to be this one center, this one commission that would judge all the projects that were being proposed and that would judge the budgets that were being promised to see if it would serve this communal goal in the interest of the Haitian people. And everybody was cheering, you know, they said, yes, this is the new phase of humanitarian aid. This is when we will stop our old mistakes. This is finally we will cooperate, all of us. 
And as soon as the goal was formulated, as soon as the commission was actually established, um, chaired uh, amongst others by, uh, by ex-president Clinton, as soon as it, is, well, it is, as it was there in place, they started to ignore it. It's like if you go, if you are rushed into the hospital with a liver infection that could be deadly, you know, you get into the hospital and the, the doctor tells you, yes, you have a liver infection, but you are overweight, so let's put you on a diet. Does it make sense? This is what we are doing in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So again, in Haiti, the uh, aid organizations and the aid donors are making the same old mistakes. And they promised to do better this time.